AI is not actually thinking. It's not actually really understanding what you're saying. It's just taking the words that you gave it and predicting what's most likely to come next. And when you say act as an expert marketer, it, you're kind of like giving it better context to then go predict from. And so you're going to get kind of better responses. Let's go. All right. Welcome to the Pubcast. I'm your host, John Loomer, and we have a really special episode today. Uh, as we're, we're spending time with someone who is an expert in the AI field. And as, as we know, this has been an important topic for all of us. I mean, marketers, Facebook advertisers, um, just really across the board ever since this chat GPT business has, has come about. And to the point where Luke and I have discussed it on a prior episode of the podcast, I've been covering it <laughs> to the best of my ability in some blog posts and videos, but I know I'm just scratching the surface. But uh, Luke is back with me today to interview this special guest. Uh, you may have seen her on TikTok covering tips for AI. I've been following her very closely, trying to stay up to date what's going on. She does a really good job of breaking this stuff down for the rest of us who aren't uh, in, experts in AI and ChatGPT to know what's going on. Um, and she's the founder of AI Exchange, Rachel Woods. How are you doing, Rachel? Welcome. I'm good. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, uh, yeah, excited for this conversation. Awesome. So it, much of our content is actually um, related to meta and meta advertising. And, and now we're kind of, we realize how big of a topic this is. And we got to start understanding, okay, how can we leverage this, you know, for what we're doing now, I understand you have a bit of a history with meta as well. I do. I worked at Facebook when it was called Facebook. That's what yeah. I like. <laughs> awesome. So what, what, what's, what's your background there? And if you could just share, you know, how did you end up doing what you're doing now? Yeah. So, um, thanks again for having me really excited yeah. to chat with you guys. Um, I actually started my career in marketing, um, which is fun. So here amongst, uh, amongst friends in that regard. Um, and then I basically got kind of, um, you know, had quite romantic thoughts about, oh, it'd be really cool to be a marketer who coded, um, mm -hmm. went and taught myself, uh, enough coding to get a job at Facebook, um, ended up on this really interesting team, which was a, like research data science team where we would basically listen to the machine learning PhDs and what they were figuring out with like the latest kind of breakthroughs in AI and ML. And then we would figure out how you actually go and apply that into the product. So some of the tools that you guys might have used in Facebook's ad manager, like creative fatigue and audience oh. overlap, actually stuff that I worked on. You know that that stuff has gone away, right? I have not been keeping up to date with this stuff as much, but yeah, it's, it's I, I know a, that there's... hot topic, hot topic. <laughs> it, for, yeah, so I I loved the the inspect tool and everything that was found mm -hmm. in it, like the creative, the the fatigue and and overlap and a bunch Audience of stuff. Audience saturation and all that. Audience stuff. saturation. And so many people didn't realize that was there. So I, was, I even was mentioning it in my training and talked about it all the time and then now it just disappeared within the last few weeks really so, a few weeks ago I, yeah okay so this is like really new yeah i'm not I'm and not i should i should be listening to your guys uh coverage <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, but so so what what took you then from that to where you are now then yeah so um while i was at facebook i was living in the bay area um spent just an obscene amount of time in wine country and then as i was um, you know, I, I really loved the the job that I was doing at Facebook at the time, um, but kind of had this opportunity through the pandemic and then being involved with wineries to go leave and start my own company. Um, and so I left in 2020 and built an e-commerce platform for the wine industry, wow. um, which was really interesting. And then from that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a total nerd. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I think about, um, I don't know, like, algorithms and ranking systems and data science in my sleep. Um, and so a lot of the product that we were building um, had kind of some of those fundamentals. 
And we were using um, GPT actually back in uh, 2021 when it first started came oh, wow. out, coming out in our product to kind of help make um, the entire process of marketing just way easier for the wineries that were using our product. Um, and so, yeah, then uh, through that experience, you know, learned a lot. That was my first kind of uh, big foray into building a um, software company. We ended up selling the company uh, in the fall of last year. Um, and then uh, kind of through everything that was coming together, it was like, hey, like the AI space is not slowing down. I had seen firsthand so much um, of the impact that it was going to have on small businesses. And so while I was figuring out what was next, I was like, hey, why don't I start a TikTok channel um, and just start talking about how AI was evolving. When I started it, like November 1st-ish, um, no one kind of really cared. Uh, like, I mean, I had... I was getting followers, you know, but like not not really in the same kind of pace. Um, but talking about things like, hey, what if you're doing a get ready with me video in the morning and it's actually an AI and not a person? Like, what do you guys think about that? You know, I was posing some of these questions. Um, and then, yeah, just like as as I kept creating content, of course, ChatGPT coming out um, was a huge, like a huge kind of like zeitgeist moment for people starting to care about AI. Yeah. Um, it's just actually kind of come together in this like really beautiful way where now I feel like I have um, an opportunity to just like make AI more accessible to more, um, you know, small businesses, non-technical people, um, people who, you know, maybe aren't in the AI Twitter bubble, reading the research papers, you know, kind of space that um, I find myself in all the time, but who have huge opportunity to apply AI in, in what they do. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we've been doing. Glug, glug, glug. Just so much you said right there. Like, I've got so many <laughs> questions, I feel like. So November 1st, you started that account. Yeah. And just talk about timing. Oh, my God. And so, yeah, if you go back and you look at the videos, there's like, uh, you'll just see. It's kind of funny um, yeah. to see how the content has like evolved. But also, I was talking about AI back then, too. Man, oh, man. Yeah. So, so did you have a, a, did you have experience with TikTok before that, or was, did it start November first? Um, I had done a little bit of like wine content in the oh, past, okay. um, but had never really taken it seriously. So, actually, one of the first things is I was like, I'm just gonna commit to posting every day for 30 days and see what happens. You know, that kind of um, yeah. that that uh, consistency really matters. But well, it's crazy. Yeah. So I started that journey like a month before that. You blew up a little bit more than I did, a lot more than I did. But that is what's so great about your account. Like, this is a super complicated topic, but you break it down in these chunks. And uh, for, so for anyone listening, follow Rachel, not just for that information, but for understanding how, understanding how to create these short videos about complicated things to make them easier to understand. So it's just really good. Yeah, I think there's a lot of relevant uh, approaches there for how um, how we kind of have given guidance for people to think about content as well. Just um, especially if you look at the way John does a lot of his stuff, it's all about kind of taking complex topics and breaking them down. Um, you said something really interesting, though, about like how AI and like chat GPT is, is kind of changed the game a lot. And it does seem like there's there's this like people realize what AI actually is, even though, of course, I'm, as you know better than anybody, it's been in everything we've already been doing. We just haven't had that like direct way to kind of like interface with it. Um, so, so, so much like a friend almost. And it seems like that's really changed a lot of the, the perception of what's possible. And I'm just curious as someone who's been so close to this and, and weaving your way through it. I mean, do, what, what do you think about that? Do you, do you think that that actually has changed anything and, and, and why? Yeah, I mean, um, it's just been a huge change. I think about it in a couple of ways. Um, one is that this isn't an official definition, but I like to think of what we used to think of as AI machine learning was a little bit more like traditional um, in the sense where in order to have these systems, you would have to have a huge amount of big data you would have to have an internal team that understand how to train these models. You'd have to have a huge amount of like compute power. Like it's just a very sophisticated and complex process to actually start using AI in businesses. 
um, which is why, you know, companies like Facebook, of course, like have the scale and magnitude to be able to do that. But even if you look at um, some of like, I remember uh, learning this at some point that so many marketplaces that we use online all the time today, like don't mm -hmm. even themselves have very sophisticated um, like machine learning models internally because it just doesn't make sense for them to have that. So that's like where we used to be with a lot of this technology. Um, and then the real, like there's been a ton of innovation. So it's really hard to say like, there's like one, one breakthrough innovation. But I think one of the big ones um, is these generative AI models, um, which just by the nature of how they work, where you can train a model on how to generate language, which is what like ChatGPT is, like how to generate text. Um, and then you can package that up and let other people use it like that uh, concept is, is quite new. And that's what's made it really accessible. And then on top of that, you have ChatGPT, which is just a really easy, approachable interface for, you know, mm -hmm. kind of more the mainstream consumer. Um, it's just kind of these like building blocks, if you will, that have made it so like now AI is actually kind of like a mainstream utility versus in the past, you used to really have to have um, quite a big organization to get started. Cheers. So take me back a little bit. So sounds like when you started that last business is when you kind of fell in love with the ChatGPT and the AI. It was ChatGPT itself that you were still using, that you're using actually in 2021? It was um, GPT-3. So that makes sense. Um, okay. yeah, because like ChatGPT is basically this like, application layer on top of GPT-3 that they've, um, you know, like fine tuned or trained to make it much better at chatting. So you can like go in and, you know, have right. it feel the conversation. Yeah. So give me an idea then, give us an idea of the, like, the various ways you're using it that made you realize like this aha moment, that this is so powerful and it's something that you want to keep working with. So like what kind of things were you automating? What, what were you doing? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys, I'd imagine you guys have played around with um, tools like Copy AI or Jasper. Um, so those were some of the early uh, kind of like consumer facing products that were using um, GPT-3. And, um, you know, we were serving uh, wineries, which people think of wineries as being this uh, very you know, romanticized type of business. But in reality, when you're a winemaker, you spend your time in the vineyard and in the cellar. You don't want to spend your time mm -hmm. like thinking about marketing. You don't want to spend your time like building a website, even like listing your wines online. So we would have all these like challenges where there's just so much like manual work around content. Um, and so kind of from seeing the technology come out and then seeing those tools, we're like, hey, why don't we um, build some features into our product that just helped our uh, our customers generate some of that marketing content um, in a much easier way. Um, and one of the best features that we built was um, like AI generated marketing emails, where mm. it would take in, you know, like um, what types of wines the winery was selling, where the winery was located. Um, it had enough context about harvest to talk about like a harvest update in context of. Pinot Noir being a thin skin grape, like it was, it was mind blowing, right? Like how good it was. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that was like, just, you, you know, and once you start with one thing, you get inspired, you're like, oh, well, what, man, what if we use <laughs> GPT to do this next thing and next thing? Um, and then, yeah, like outside of that, I think um, some of the things that still excite me a lot, and I, you know, I thought about a lot back in like November, um, October, like timeframe, just like these models can help you brainstorm or reason or like just think through things like a totally different way. Um, and if, I feel like that's still like a super underexplored space too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's for me, that's the primary way I use chat GPT right now. Like I, I still haven't really gotten into the, the playground, but um, just asking it questions, trying to get some ideas for like titles, for example, uh, just for uh, like I, I'm putting together a training right now and I asked like I, I submitted like my initial list like give me some more examples some more ideas so it's things like that but where I'm really stuck is on where it gets more advanced and mm -hmm. it's integrating with the API and I'm just starting to realize like how powerful that is 
um, once you start integrating with the API and that's the part where my brain doesn't really latch onto how you do all that. So what are some of these more advanced things that you can do once you're integrated with the API? You, you mentioned, um, you know, email, email marketing. What are some other things you could do with that? Yeah, I mean, I like to think about um, any of the mundane manual tasks you have. You can probably get AI to help you start doing that today. Um, or another way to think about it is like, if you could train an intern to do it, you can probably train AI to do it. You know, someone doesn't have much experience. Like, um, And so like one of the ways, you know, we use AI right now is we um, have our own kind of like automation process set up, for example, to like triage our email inbox, um, because a huge part of our community is people being able to like ask us questions and we try to, you know, respond, provide guides and resources all the time. So that creates a huge volume of emails. So we have AI helping us kind of tag triage and even draft um, those responses. And that's just like crazy, right? That like yes. I, could, I could take uh, AI, plug it in via API to an automation tool. And then all of a sudden I have like you know, something like writing emails for me in my tone. I am really bad at answering emails. This sounds awesome. So, so how would you, how do you do that though? How does that integrate? So is it like integrate with Google mail or something? I mean, I'm going to sound really ignorant by asking these questions, but how do you no, do no, that? No. Um, yeah. I mean, you can, you can really like, um, uh, when you learn the automation side and I actually wasn't really big into automations before um i felt like oh it was like useful for some things but a lot of times i felt like oh the effort to go set up an automation kind of outweighed the effort to just do the task like so i never had really seen that value but then now that you can plug ai into automations it's just like oh my gosh like you can automate so much more more like complex things so i've like really really um uh gotten on the automation train mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like what, you know, like how we have it set up, we use help scout, um, which is like one of the email, uh, inbox management systems for like customer support. Usually it's kind of similar like intercom. Um, and then you just, you know, uh, start plugging these tools together. Um, you can use like Zapier as mm -hmm. one example of an automation tool. Um, we use make a lot. Um, it's like our preferred tool, but they're really uh, the interfaces are are pretty um, manageable once you start to learn it. Cause then you just think about, hey, step one, you get an email from uh, your customer support thing. Now, step two, let's send that email to OpenAI via API and ask it, what is this email about? Write us some bullet points and give us a subject or like a tag. Okay, then based on if it's about um, you know, refunds or about uh, shipping or, you know, whatever the, if you're an e-commerce brand or whatever the use case is, you can kind of branch out your process. And then all of a sudden, you know, once you've mapped all that stuff out, then it's, you have this system that's just kind of like helping you and doing this like work for you. It's, it's pretty incredible. Cheers. No, I was just going to say, I think one, one thing that I've, so everything you're saying there is like, like, that's the kind of stuff I love. Like, um, cause I, similar to you, I have like a, I was kind of like a marketer who decided to try to do the coding thing. Um, and, and I found kind of a niche there because like, if you can learn enough to, to be dangerous, you can be really dangerous in a lot of cases, especially mm -hmm. once you start getting comfortable with some of the tech, like you're, you're describing even just kind of like setting up these flows and thinking through the use cases. But one of the, um, the really cool, exciting things about kind of what you're describing too is like a lot of these solutions are low or no code, uh, right? Because mm -hmm. like, it's like you don't necessarily have to know all of that. But of course, if you know some of it, especially if something's breaking or not working exactly the way you think it should, then you, it helps you kind of troubleshoot it. But I think like, um, not to like change themes too much, but one of the things that that kind of brings up for me is is like, not really being afraid of it because you, there's still an opportunity for people in there and for people to really think about creative and useful applications. It's not like you do it and it's done. There's always going to be more work to do, right? So like we improve these processes, things get better. Something else is going to be available for us to improve or work on. And I think that, that what you're describing is like exactly the kind of thing that I think is really um, 
powerful that it's hard for people to really know how powerful it is until they go through one of the use cases like what you're saying. It's like, think about, oh, what's something you're spending a lot of time on and it's like driving you crazy or it's really frustrating. That's usually a really good place to start, right? Yeah, a thousand percent. I feel like, um, you know, I mean, like AI is this huge potential step change for a lot of businesses and work, but um, it is so far away from like actual human <laughs> capability <laughs> still, like to be, you know, to be clear, right, too. So it's like, I think people having this mindset of like, okay, how do I just use this to automate the boring stuff that I don't like doing? Or like, man, imagine if you never had to respond to an email again. Like, wouldn't we all just be like happier? <laughs> you know? Um, I, so I think uh, I think you have totally the right mindset there. Yeah, one of my favorite, um, like early AI things that I started using was um, this thing is called, um, I think it was called Amy. And it was a uh, calendar scheduling assistant so like you could copy it on your response to someone and say amy help me set up a meeting next week find a time with this person and it would correspond with the person and they even had trained it so that it would like delay before it sent emails to people and i would always say in my emails to people this is my ai assistant it's not real and people would still like talk to it like it was real. And then they'd even later say, like, I guess I had people who just skipped over that part of the email. They'd say, your, your assistant's so friendly. And it's like they didn't realize it was like an AI system. And to your point about like, OK, they're not quite there, but they, they it's interesting to see these different use cases that come out where if it's a very specific use case, they can make things feel very real. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of a, another interesting layer as we're starting to see some of these systems come out is like what's the degree of specialization like here's an ai that does just this whereas you have more of like a generalist ai which i think is kind of the way people are thinking about chat gpt right now is like it's this generalist ai for text essentially even though it can do all these other stuff, things too and and i just wonder like how how you think about that layer in terms of like specialization versus generalist um, AI and, and even how you might categorize that in some of your materials on the AI exchange? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I guess there's like two sides of it, probably. One is um, kind of speaking about like the breakthroughs of what we have right now. One of the reasons why, um, from like my intuition, people I've talked to is one of the reasons why GPT is so powerful is because it is multidisciplinary right like it actually just kind of like understands a much broader set of problems than like we've ever had systems before which is like kind of crazy because it's like kind of how humans like you know smart people we're, we're like okay you have a, a varied set of experiences um but that being said, like just a generic thing isn't going to always be like the best at something, right? So it's actually really similar to people also where like you need generalists and you need specialists. What I'm really excited about is, um, you know, there's a, a huge new wave of software companies that are being built right now um, and existing software companies that are kind of like rethinking their strategies, um, but everything being very like AI native. So like how would we design a workflow or how do we design like do you even have to make your own ads anymore, right? Um, and I'm not saying in a uh, in like a over aggrandized sense, but just so like, what if like how um, you know creative teams uh, delegate to each other? You could now delegate to an AI where like everyone is kind of the creative director, right? Instead of the creative executor, or you have someone come in and and do the final touches um, to really get that that piece um, of creative to be its like best performance. All of that those questions and just like that rethinking is like all going on like literally right now. And so I feel like six to 12 to 18 months from now, we're just going to have like an entirely new landscape of the tools that we use, which will be really cool. Cheers. It's cool. It's exciting. It's a little overwhelming and maybe even scary to some of us. Right. <clears throat> Especially if we haven't been following this stuff all that closely. I mean, we think about it and everything you mentioned there, like uh, so Jasper AI and other kind of copywriting uh, tools. And then you have video creation AI and image creation AI. And so much of that process could then be helped with AI. And I think what 
we kind of alluded to this a moment ago about where it is now. Like there's not really anything to be worried about, um, about it being smarter than people, but we know that's going to get better and better. The, the, probably the main thing I hear from people who are skeptics of it or are scared of it, or they're, they're afraid of being replaced. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you hear a lot of that stuff too. I mean, how do you, especially as you look a year, two years down the, down the road, I mean, what do, what do you think about that concern? I mean, I guess I'm just an optimist that humans always figure stuff out. Um, and I think it like, while it's really exciting, I think it's also not going to happen as fast as the people who are worried about how fast it's going to happen is going to happen, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're really to take what um, AI or ChatGPT generates the first time around and put that in like an email every single time, like you're going to send a lot of really bad emails, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like there's just still, we're, we still have such a gap. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've been kind of exploring this question a lot personally too, and thinking about, um, you know, as I'm building my business, what, is, what role does AI have in the business? What role um, does growing a team have? How do you balance those two? It's like really interesting. I'm like, you know what? It sounds pretty nice to like be able to do the same amount, but just work less. Right. Um, or maybe you still have the same size of teams. Why do you need to work 40 hours a week or uh, who am I kidding? I don't work 40 hours. I probably work like way more. Right. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be nice to actually just work 40 hours? Um, you know, and so I think like um, having kind of that lens when you're looking at this technology um, is important. Yeah. And I, I kind of wonder how long, and I'm sure this is probably happening already, but how long before a very, um, very optimistic entrepreneur goes and creates their own AI team, you know, to basically do all of these different tasks that... I mean, that kind of exists, doesn't it? Right. But, uh... but, but it's almost like how long before people like you two are then the AI entrepreneur telling everybody how to be the AI entrepreneur and giving people like guidance on the model. And, and maybe that's already kind of like what you're thinking about. I don't know, but it, it does seem like there's, there's this, if you look at like the positive optimistic side, there's a lot of opportunity there. I think there's still a lot of opportunity for bad stuff too. And we talked about this on, on our last podcast about, well, yeah, that's very easy. You got your, you could be your entrepreneur. Or you could be also be an entrepreneur fisher or hacker that has your AI team that's supporting everything you're doing and making all of your robocalls and sending all of your emails and responding to everybody and grabbing their da data. So yeah, you know, it can go both ways, but, but I do think that there's, um, there's this really interesting future that is, it feels pretty near, but you also said something really interesting that I wasn't expecting you to say, where you said it's maybe a little further away than some of us think. And so as someone who's pretty close to that, I, I was kind of expecting you to to say like, oh, it'll be here before you know it, or it's already here. So I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that perception. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess I think it's kind of both. And I, I think everybody almost has both perspectives kind of in their brain too, right? Like you can make an, ar anybody can make an argument for like, okay, AI is going to change every single aspect of how I work in the next six months or eh, it's probably going to take like five, 10, 20 years. Um, I mean, I've been studying like the internet a lot. I've been thinking a lot about how there's still so many businesses that do so much of their bookkeeping pen and paper and thinking about the value of human connection and interaction. Like how do you, um, model decision making, um, what types of things you just not trust in AI to do? Like, would you trust AI to do your taxes? Like, it's a really interesting question because like taxes are like something a lot of people don't like doing, but then also there's like a pretty big consequence if you don't do your taxes mm -hmm. right in some cases, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's like really hard um, to have like a general perspective, but for anybody who's like concerned about how quickly it's moving, my best advice is just like pay attention and like be part of the wave and chill out a little bit. Cause it's like, it's not going to happen like tomorrow, you know? Um, 
but yeah, we're just, we're also still so early. I think that's another thing that is really fascinating for any, anybody who has been like building AI products or it's been in kind of that, uh, side of this bubble is like, it's just crazy that the mainstream consumer public knows this much and cares this much about a new technology like this as early as we're at. Like, that's just, you know, part of that is also wild. Cheers. So what haven't you automated yet that you want to automate? Um, we are building out um, kind of like a co-pilot for all of our content creation. So b back to like, I don't think AI can create better content than I can. I, right like tried right um and i'm like yeah okay like maybe i'm just not a good enough prompter right but like i just actually think that um technology is like not close to being there yet but there are a lot of pieces around um kind of like thinking about putting other content or repurposing content that we're trying to use ai for right now um and that's been really fun so you, you talked about it's not as good of a, a writer as you yet um have you and I'm sure you've gone through all those steps of like trying to train it, right? To try to train it to have your voice. Have you done that? So we have, yeah. Can, can you explain that process? Because that's something that, like, at least with ChatGPT, I've tried to do. Like, I fed it, you know, my my blog posts and like, you know, learn my style and this and that. And I, I feel like kind of like what you're saying. I, I never really get what I'm hoping to get in return. Like, okay, now write a blog post in this style. Maybe I'm missing something. I mean, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, um, I think we're also still, I guess, just like really early in figuring out how yeah. a lot of that works. Um, but some of the ways that you can get from kind of the generic responses with chat GPT to a more customized response is one actually just like spending the time getting good at prompting. Um, like I kind of think of it as um, the first time we all like had to go to fully remote work world and you realize like, man, it really like stinks to be on zoom like 24 seven. You can't really like get on zoom for every single thing you're trying to like tell someone you had to kind of like learn to be like extremely articulate mm -hmm. uh, over like written text. It's kind of that like the same, just like new muscle. I feel like that we're learning. Um, and then you can actually fine tune these models, um, which is something that's like a bit more of an advanced concept. But even that right now, um, like either like the research is still really early on how to get that to work really, really well for most use cases, or there's even a possibility that that's not even like the right approach um, for using AI in a more like custom way. When I say we're early, I mean, there are literally research papers being drafted right <laughs> now of like, this approach didn't work, this approach didn't work, this approach didn't work. Um, you know, or maybe someone will be like, this approach actually worked. And then, um, you know, that will, uh, uh, and that's, that's a lot of the stuff that we share. Um, I literally spend a lot of time just reading these research papers so people don't have to, um, but. and you, you write all that that's not written by AI. No, I do use AI to help me, uh, like skim them sometimes. And I've, uh, posted a, there's a tool I love using. It's called explain paper. Um, mm. which, you know, it's, it's, some of these papers are like 20, 30 pages of like really dense stuff. And you're like, okay, cool. Did you, was this a break? You know, was this like worth reading? And like, what was the general approach? Um, so I'll use it for that. Explain paper. You said. Explain yeah. paper. All yeah. right. I'm going to check that one out. I hadn't seen that one before. It's probably, is it on the AI exchange? It is. Yeah. All right. Well, of course it is. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I think you've mentioned three tools now that I know I need to check out. And like Make yeah. was another one. So Make, you said, is like a replacement for Zapier or Zapier. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, to, how we're supposed yeah. to Yeah, maybe part of it is I don't know how to say Zapier, so I just can't use the tool. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I don't think any of us know how to say that one. We've always, no. yeah, I've heard it pronounced different times every time everybody says it. Well, if it makes sense, if it's Zapier, because you make zaps. Right. Right. I've heard your justification on that before. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. You had mentioned Rachel, you know, talking about how to how to prompt ChatGPT or GPT, and I think that's that, that's something I've learned from you too, the importance of prompt engineering. And this is something I feel like anyone can start to make better use of that ChatGPT tool 
if they be become a good prompt engineer as opposed to like just put in a question and they look at the response and like, oh, that's not good enough. That's not what I asked for. That's that's low quality or whatever. It's all about mm -hmm. being a prompt engineer. What goes into being a good prompt engineer? Yeah, um, I, mean, I feel like this is going to be like the catchphrase of the conversation. <laughs> like, we're still so early. Um, no, but I mean, I actually think um, you're very much right on the, you know, the quality of the uh, prompt or the question or the instructions that you're giving these systems really, really does impact the result. And even as I've spoken to people, I love when someone says, I use ChatGPT and I just don't really get it because then I'm like, oh, tell me, what did you try? Mm -hmm. And the really uh, common thread amongst um, that camp of people is that usually they have asked ChatGPT to help them with something very generic. So they'll say like, write me a marketing email about a you know, shoe wear brand. It's like, okay, then you're going to get a generic shoe wear brand email. But if you're like, you know, if you start describing more of your task and you're more specific, you set the context well of like, what does your shoe wear brand care about? Um, and you can even say like what your goals are, right? Is your goal to build more loyalty with your audience? Is your goal to convert them on the sale you're having? Like just the more um, specific you get, the more likely your response is going to be better. Um, so that's just like a general concept. Then there's a lot of um, kind of emerging research on like a little bit peeling back the onion of how do we um, help the AI model find the best parts of uh, what it's learned from, but more specifically like the patterns it's learned to get good responses. Um, so if you've seen the really popular prompt approach of saying, act as an expert marketer. Mm -hmm. That's why that, uh, that's the theory, at least right now, the leading theory of like, that's why that works is because it's kind of like activating that part of the patterns that the model has learned from the data it's been trained on, um, which, you know, can be helpful just as you're, I, I think if I were to zoom out and say like, when you're using these tools, the kind of bizarre mindset shift to have, if you can, is like, Hey, they're they're actually not think that like AI is not actually thinking. It's not actually really understanding what you're saying. It's just taking the words that you gave it and predicting what's most likely to come next. And when you say act as an expert marketer, it, you're kind of like giving it better context to then go predict from, and so you're going to get kind of better responses. Um, but I still think we're so early in like what makes a good <laughs> prompt engineer. Um, probably asking like six months, like what's, what's the best advice for this? I'll be like, all right, here's the new things, you know, that we've figured out. Yeah. I saw you talking about that in a TikTok video. Um, that whole thing about like, we don't really understand like what it's actually doing there, which I thought was like really cool because I know one of the things we, we talk a lot about in the ML world, um, is like this whole thing about like the black boxiness of like at some point we don't really understand what it's doing because especially if you have like unsupervised learning models and all this and you'll explain this way better than I ever would and if I'm saying anything wrong um, please correct it but it's basically like at some point we don't really know how or why it's doing what it's doing but I think like you explaining that thing about like the act as an expert marketer the way that I that I conceptualized it after you kind of went through that in your TikTok video was like almost thinking about it as like in our brains, we have different parts of our brains do different things, right? So something about emotion, sight, taste, whatever. And so you're almost like telling it what part of the brain to go to when you're mm -hmm. telling it like act as an expert marketer. It goes to that place where it's got all of this stuff sort of related to what does an expert marketer actually look like. Now, there might be connections across other parts of the brain, but that it's using that as like it's like it's way it's it's like it's it's its subway route, right? It's like shooting all all through the 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 network based on sort of that prompt. And I don't know if that makes any sense at all. And I'm not really sure if that like helps, but in case it helps anybody else, just when you described it, that's the way I was thinking about it. Because up until I watched your video, 
I was thinking, oh, it knows how to respond as an expert marketer would. But the way you explained it is like, no, you're kind of telling it sort of what to target. You know, it's like mm -hmm. what to think, what I mean, what to think about in a way. But um, but I, I know you, you kind of mentioned also in your video, that's like the nerdy thing. But can you talk about that a little bit? I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I actually think your um, kind of depiction of it is like a really good way to think about it of at least how some really, really smart people are starting to conceptualize like what's actually happening when we prompt in these ways. Um, the example that I loved was there's a really clear example of um, AI or like GPT being better at translating from um, English to French when um, you say, you know, you're a, a masterful or below is a transcript of a masterful French um, translator who uh, was given the, the phrase blank and then has uh, translated into blank, right? And like, um, what's nice about the way that these um, like AI researchers are studying these models is they have all these like techniques, right? To be like, you know, um, for a fact that uh, this English phrase equals this French phrase. And so you can actually have like a data set of all those phrases. And then you can say, okay, well, if we just say like translate this English to French, we can see how many times it was correct. And then, but if we do say like, you know, imagine you're a masterful translator, then you can have the English phrase and the French phrase and you can see how many times that's correct. And what they found is like that second one performs better. So like they're starting to do all these like really smart ways to research like what's actually happening, right? And then once they have a breakthrough, they're like, okay, now how do we like conceptualize or explain this black box? But um, yeah, it's just, it's like incredibly fascinating. So, and I, I think maybe like another thing for anybody who's listening, um, it's like, oh, I, I'm not an AI researcher. Like maybe I have no business in like doing prompt engineering and all that stuff. It's like, Actually, I a thousand percent disagree with that um, because right now we only have the perspective um, of the people that are doing this research like to date. And one thing that's like super cool is you never know what you're going to find in chat GPT that works way better. Right. Um, and so like just the fact that more people are experimenting with it with different life ex like experiences, diverse perspectives, more creative approaches. I feel like we're also going to maybe like see some crazy breakthroughs from, you know, maybe from one of you guys. <laughs> maybe instead of prompt engineers, we can have like prompt miners, right? It's like you're, you're like yeah. mining for the the best, the best way to to find something. In fact, our, our, another thing you posted was also like, wasn't there a prompt engineer job that, mm -hmm. that you had seen? And it was like the first, first example. I thought that was, that was pretty fascinating too. Yeah. I've been waiting for that. I set up like alerts on Indeed, um, you know, and it'd be like, Tell me when the jobs come out that are like prompt engineering and, and GPT and stuff. That one, I actually found that someone like tweeted it and everything. But I think that's going to be also really interesting to watch how those jobs evolve. Bottoms up. Uh, I have a it's not to go too far back, but um, John, can I ask a quick question yeah. about oh. um, about your your usage? Um, and this is another thing you, you've kind of um, made some content on. I thought it was kind of interesting. So. Uh, going back to the 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 theme of low no code options, you had mm -hmm. um, some of these Google Sheet integrations, which I'm a big like Google Sheet, and I use Looker Studio and all that, and connect everything, and I love it. It's all all fun stuff, but um, I, it, it's sort of related to also what people are just kind of like telling all of their secrets and all of their their mm -hmm. business intel and passing all of that to Chat GPT. It, whether that's through these Google Sheets integrations or directly through the chat GPT interface or open AI API, whatever it may be. I'm just curious, like, what are your thoughts on, on, is that a good idea? I mean, should we be concerned about that? Like, I'm not, I know you're not an attorney, of course, but, um, but I am kind of surprised at some of the examples people share. I'm like, I can't believe you actually, number one, passed that to ChatGPT, but now you're posting a screenshot of <laughs> what you said on like, you know, social media or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I generally think that being a conscious uh, consumer online about the data that you're sharing is like super important. Um, you know, uh, we've actually looked into this a little bit just because we've gotten a lot of questions around it. So, um, 
you know, chat GPT, they've been very explicit that they are using the questions you're putting in and the responses you're getting out to help both the team understand how people are using a system like this. And then um, second, to feed it back to, um, you know, the AI model to improve it. And so that's just like super important to understand if anybody's using it, just um, be aware that your uh, data is being shared in that way. And then um, usage of the API or, you know, GPT-3, which is, again, that model that actually powers ChatGPT. Um, it's, so they've set that up to be a lot more kind of like commercial or production ready in terms of its usage. Um, they have like really clear terms of service um, that like you own the input, you own the output. Um, they say we will look at uh, occasionally, you know, responses to figure out how to improve it, but then you can actually opt out. Um, they have a way in their terms of service so you can go and request that. And so I think like with anybody that's using these systems, it's like just really important that if you are going to use it for something that you would be concerned about a company having access to, like you should do the work yourself, talk to your attorneys and figure out like, okay, what are the boundaries we should be respecting here? There's so much hype here that, I mean, if you're going to be a, a bad player, like mm -hmm. you're going to focus on this because people are, they're so hungry for stuff. And I think that it's also, um, I mean, there's just, there's, we, we talked about some of the risks of misinformation being driven by some of these tools, but I've seen so much misinformation around what chat GPT even is. Like, when is it, does it cost money yet? When's it going to, like, I've seen so many wrong things people sharing on that and they're like oh it's no longer free you have to pay today and it's like of course that that's not what's you know it's just people are missing all of this context and it, it's like it's kind of great that it's as democratized as it is but it's also like it's just a minefield so that's just a plug also for folks like yourself who are helping other people really navigate this because it is is not something that I think the common folk um, that are kind of out here working in the space even are, are really, should, we should be trusting ourselves to, to kind of know everything that's up and, and people will just, they just sign right up for these things. It's crazy to me. But yeah. Anyway, that's my, that's my soapbox on that. <laughs> I mean, it, like we, um, you know, spend days at a time researching stuff before we're posting that like we take that you know and of course like um you know there's always a risk that we don't have like the full picture or don't have full information um so i always recommend people like you know uh, do your own um legwork as well but yeah it's um it's just like a really important time to be a mindful consumer in the space the other thing that's super different right if we like compare this to the evolution of the internet like we didn't have the internet to talk about the internet when the internet became a thing, but now we have the internet to talk about <laughs> AI, right? And so I think just like the pace at which information is spreading um, or, or gets shared about this is quite like different than we've ever had before with a you know technology shift that's like this big. Last call. I feel like we could talk to you all day. Rachel, I, I, there's just one more thing I want to make sure I asked you um, regarding the playground, because that, that seems like it's the next step from just using the main interface. Yes. I don't completely get it. Could you kind of explain what the playground is and why we should use that? Yeah. So um, my best advice for anybody who is like, cool, I've been using ChatGPT. I want to really start using this seriously in my business is to go learn the playground. Um, which you can access by going to beta.openai.com slash playground. Um, you need to create an account with OpenAI if you don't already have it. Um, you It does cost money, so you need to like put in, I think, payment information, and then they give you $18-ish of free credits, um, which is like probably hundreds of requests. So you do have like enough to play with um, to go and get started. But what it does when you go to the playground is you get direct access to the model, the AI model that powers chat GPT, um, like the actual kind of core of it, uh, which is called GPT-3. And um, 
it is slightly different. So like the difference between the two, right? Is like ChatGPT was, um, you took that core model and then you made it really, really good at chatting with people or dialogue. And so um, when people get into the playground, they'll notice immediately, it's a little bit less of a conversational interface. In fact, it's like just a box and you just write your prompt and then you click submit and then it generates the response. But once you start getting familiar with the playground and that way to interact with um, these AI models, then you can take that and use it in an API in like any tool that you're using that has an API you know, connection. We talked about automation tools a lot um, through this conversation. And that's really where like the, the creme de la creme like ways to use um, AI uh, starts kind of coming um, to fruition. Uh, a good example is like if you go in there, if you go into chat GPT and you ask it to maybe like, um, uh, you know, a really simple question where you'd expect a one word answer, right? You get these like huge verbose answers and like mm -hmm. that's because uh, it was trained to be good at chat. But then when you go to OpenAI, the playground directly, you ask it that same question, you'll get just your answer. So you, you just start to see like it's like a much more like vanilla, like just basic like uh, version where you can then start building on top of it. So highly, highly recommend playing around with it. Awesome. Loopy so that's the homework else? for today's yeah, podcast yeah. is go use, because last time we said go use ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. So now it's going to be go use the OpenAI Playground, which I think is a, it's a great takeaway. Absolutely. Well, Rachel, thanks so much uh, for joining us and helping us make sense of AI and ChatGPT and telling us it's still early and, and not to be afraid of it. Because um, it, it's overwhelming for most of us who, you know, who are, this, it's just been what, a month and a half, two months or whatever that most of us have, have jumped into it. Um, but for those of you who want to stay up to date on this stuff, follow Rachel. It's the underscore Rachel underscore Woods on TikTok, right? I think wrong? it would be the period, Rachel. Oh, the period. Yeah, period I instead so. of underscore. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm okay. underscore on Twitter. And right. yeah, but. I also just searched Rachel Woods AI on TikTok and, and you come up. So that's, yeah, just, that's another way to search. do it if you don't I, want to. I think I'm the, the only Rachel Woods talking about AI for now. <laughs> for now. There are a bunch of Rachel Woods out there otherwise. Though. There's a but, but um, and then the AI exchange.com, great newsletter. I mean, where can people find you in general? Yeah, I always like to point people to our newsletter. That's really where we try to curate and consolidate the highest value stuff, especially if you don't want to be a nerd that has to read all the research papers and you just want to know what's really useful and we should start thinking about to apply AI in your work, then um, the newsletter is the best place to go. Awesome. Uh, Luke, Luke, you put this question in there. I'm going to ask it. So if you oh, yeah. had an eight if you had an AI personal assistant, Rachel, what would you name it? What would I name it? Um, I like Amy. That's kind of a funny. <laughs> <guy>. <laughs> I don't mean to like steal that company's branding, but I'm like, man, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Awesome. Maybe I'll we'll stick with that. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Uh, you bet. Until next time, everybody, do awesome things. I'm out.